And so I sat with her and said, look, we've tried everything, we, we can't get you better. And um, I was very sorry for that, but she just looked at me, so oh, don't worry, that's that's fine because my people, when I was with, when I had this injury, they wouldn't even sit with me, but you've held me, you've helped me stand up, you've put your arms around me when I was leaking urine in pieces, you've shown me love, and that's enough. So um, anyone can do that. Anyone can share love with anybody, um, particularly those who are vulnerable and, and in need. And um, that to share, I mean, you can do it across different languages, different cultures, different um, genders, different age groups. I mean, it's just a, a common thing that's the, the foundation of our Christian life is to, to love your neighbour as yourself. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Andrew Browning. Thank you. So I would love to start with a quote from your book, A Doctor in Africa. They were typical of many of my patients squatting nervously on the floor outside the examination room, dressed in clothes soaked in urine, too ashamed of their smell and appearance to raise their heads to greet me. So obviously you have dedicated most of your life to the prevention and healing of obstetric fistulas in women. And I would love to know what initially pulled you to this work? Um, It started a long time ago, I guess. When I was six years old, I grew up in a Christian household and used to go to Sunday school every Sunday morning. And one Sunday morning as a six-year-old, I was sitting on the wooden floor of the Sunday school hall down in Barrow in New South Wales, Southern Highlands, and a returned missionary, a returned missionary nurse had come to speak to the church about um, her work in Africa. And she was a missionary that the church had been supporting for a number of years. And so she was in the Sunday school hall and I was sitting at her feet and she was telling me all sorts of you know, exciting stories about her life in Africa, about lions, about giraffe, about different tribes and spears and bows and arrows and all sorts of exciting things for a six-year-old boy to hear. And um, from that moment, I thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to be a missionary in Africa as well. So it was quite a a fanciful um, notion, a romantic notion in a a six-year-old boy's imagination. But um, as as I grew And I actually committed my life to Christ and at the age of 14, and I thought, well, if I've done that and I'm taking my Christian life seriously, I I should serve as Christ has asked us to serve. And so serving as a missionary, as a missionary doctor, seemed to be the best way to do it. But how to get into fistula? Um, I initially went to Africa to the hospital that the missionary nurse had been in as a as a medical student, and I was right at the Rwandan, beginning of the Rwanda genocide. So I was there right on the Rwandan border of Tanzania, and we had about 20,000 refugees arrive on the doorstep, and there was horrific um, stories and horrific injuries and all sorts of horrible, horrible things. But I was convinced then that this is what I should do with my life. I should be um, serving out my life to to help um, the poor. Uh, So as a junior doctor, I quit my job um, as a junior doctor and went to Ethiopia, my aunt had been living in Ethiopia for about 40 years. She's quite an unusual lady. She went as a missionary and she was married into the nomadic tribe of northern Ethiopia in the desert called the Afar. So she had married a tribal elder. She had been living like a nomad in the desert and she had started a huge development organisation for the Afar with literacy, with healthcare, with road building, with water capture to veterinary work to everything. So she directly looks after her and her husband and her now 750 staff, all AFAR trained, um, directly look after about one and a half million AFAR people with everything. They're pretty well the government of the AFAR region. So I worked with her and um, in the desert, it was pretty hard going, 50 degree heat and wandering around with camels trying to treat people with malaria while suffering malaria yourself uh, underneath acacia trees and scrubs and things like that. So, um, but visited a, a hospital in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, called the Fistula Hospital. And there was a lovely Australian lady called Catherine Hamlin who was running the hospital. Her husband had died a year and a half before, and so she was continuing the work and uh, decided to stay uh, and she ever whenever I was in Addis she'd asked me to come to the hospital and help her with the operations and I just fell in love with the patients and fell in love with the work uh, much more than I did with the uh, the Afar Desert 
<laughs> I must admit. And, and when I left Ethiopia that time, she offered me a, a job uh, as a fistula surgeon. So from then on, that was been what my life has been committed to. So, yeah, so there been lots of steps and lots of hurdles on the way, but um, here I am. 30 whatever years, like 25 years later after that time and still doing fistula work. So in doing, obviously, as you said, um, you did some work sort of along the Rwandan uh, border, sort of pre-Rwandan genocide, and then you did work with um, working with women with fistulas. What was the biggest difference for you in terms of your sense of commitment to working more specialised in in the area of fistula? Well, I mean, the commitment came around just from meeting the patients. And maybe if I tell you a story of a, a patient, it might give the, the listeners an idea of the impact that you can make in these women. There's so many thousands of stories I could tell. I've met over 12,000 fistula patients in my life, but um, and there's so many that are special. Uh, but I'll tell you one story of uh, one patient that I treated in Tanzania um, a few years ago. Her name was Ngolo, and she was typical of many women that I meet and that she was married young, probably around about 14 or 15. They don't really know their age. And she lived in a, a village in the deep south of Tanzania and there was no hospitals nearby and um, the closest one was 120 kilometres away. And getting married at that age is normal. So she was soon pregnant after getting married and she did what all the women in the village of that area did and indeed what most women in the world do and she tried to deliver her baby at home because there was simply no way that she could get to that hospital 120 kilometers away even if she wanted to um, or even if she had to. So um, she went into labor and after a full day of labor she still hadn't delivered her child. She was one of the unlucky five percent of women that will get into what's called obstructed labour, which simply means if this is the mother's, if you can see that, mother's pelvis, baby's head is just getting stuck. It's not fitting. So either the baby's head's too big or coming out the wrong way or the mother's pelvis is too small, it's getting stuck. So that happens here in Australia. The midwife will diagnose that in labour, call the doctor, come along, have a caesarean, and everything's fine. But for Angolo, there's no doctors, there's no midwives, there's nobody, not even a Panadol to help the pain. So she stayed in labour, and after two days of labour, she still hadn't delivered her child. Her husband, he was illiterate as well, he'd never been to school, but he was frantic to figure out how he could help his wife. But he had the idea that if he boiled a basin of water and he put her feet into the boiling water, it would stimulate her uterus to contract. He did this for two more days. So after four days of labour, Ngolo still hadn't delivered her child. She was now unconscious and with burns on her feet. On the fifth day of labour, unconscious, she delivered a dead child. It took her two more days to regain consciousness. And when she finally did <clears throat> regain consciousness, although the family thought that she would die, but she did regain consciousness, um, she found that she was leaking uncontrollably from her bladder <clears throat> and also her bowel. Because she'd been in labour for so long, the baby's head had been pressed against her, the bony pelvis and all the tissues between, which is the tissues of the bladder, birth canal, rectum, birth canal, all were crushed. So all those tissues died. And so after she delivered her stillborn child, all those dead tissues came away and she was left with a big fistula or a hole between bladder, outside world, and rectum, outside world. So she leaked continually. She smelt. She was ashamed. Husband divorced her. She went to live with her mother. Her mother couldn't look after her in the house because she smelt so badly. So she was put in a little mud hut on the edge of the family compound and unable to walk because of burns on her feet, she stayed in that mud hut alone for 18 months. She was eventually found by a mission and brought to that hospital 120 kilometres away in quite a poor state. The doctors in that hospital tried to help her, but they hadn't been trained in fistula surgery and they tried three different operations. They all failed. She was eventually found by our outreach workers and brought to me in northern Tanzania and we operated on her. And um, she was awake during the operation. We give what's called a spinal anaesthetic, very safe anaesthetic. So they're awake, but numb from the waist down. 
And Paul and Gollo had so given up hope that she could ever be cured that she just sobbed uncontrollably through the operation. So these women have suffered an enormous amount. As I said, I've met over 12,000 fistula patients in my life um, and operated on, personally operated on a, about 7,000 of them. It's um, devastating meeting these women and hearing their suffering. And Golo's story is not unusual. It's quite a common story that I hear. But um, the impact that you can make in these women's lives is, is profound. They come dejected, divorced, ostracized, uniformly depressed. 40% have tried or thought about suicide. But if you operate, you can get most of them cured. So after two weeks after the operation, we had catheters in her bladder, tubes in her bladder while the bladder healed. And we also had to make a new birth canal for her because all that was destroyed as well. But two weeks later, we removed the catheter. And Angolo was anxious to see if the operation had worked, as were we. But she was totally dry, totally restored. And she was absolutely overjoyed from someone who was had tears of suffering and misery to clapping her hands and jumping up and down and saying, look, I want to go back to my village and I never want to meet another man. I never want to be married again, which is not a bad thought. And uh, I want to go to school and start a new life. So um, I caught up with her a year and a half ago and uh, back in the in Tanzania and she's back in her village and going to school and starting a new life. So we're very, very thankful for that. So to have done that, you know, you know, met, been involved in women's lives, been very privileged to be able to be involved with those over you know, 12,000 women's lives like that um, is, uh, yeah, you can't turn your back on that. You have to, uh, it's very addictive. So we moved back to Australia uh, three years ago for our boys' schooling, but our projects and our arts and everything that we do is still very much back in Africa. And um, I'm hope, still commuting back to Africa, even in coronavirus time, so trying to get back in a, a month or so. Uh, to do more teaching and operating. We've got about 90 patients waiting for operations in October. Um, yeah, so, and hopefully I'll be able to do this work for many more years to come. Yeah, it's in reading your book, sort of what you mentioned along the themes of like shame that comes with this sort of experience, it really, that was something that really struck me in your book is reading many different stories of, of you know, not just experiencing a fistula and the, the physical um, experience that comes with that, but also the the mental and the spiritual experience of being isolated. Um, is that something that you find is a common pattern throughout? Because I know that you have also done work in Southeast Asia. Is that is that form of isolation and shame that comes with this type of experience the same throughout the world? No, not, it varies from country to country and culture to culture, and even within countries, different tribes, um, uh, different cultures, and that, so that um, changes a little bit. So some of the, the cultures of the tribes that I've been with is, is totally taboo, so bad smells are totally taboo, and so the women are very isolated, very rejected. Um, yeah, I mean, I've had ladies come, you know, been locked away in the hut for 12 years sometimes, um, completely malnourished, sometimes weighing 80, 28 kilos because they're only fed once every two days, some food slipped into their hut and so forth, and miserable, miserable lives. Um, but other places, um, they're better supported. Uh, they um, are richer too, so they can afford, you know, they might have better access to water. I mean, they'd never have water in their house, but um, better access to water from a, a well or a river or something like that so they can wash and keep themselves clean and might have cloths so they can use as pads uh, to try and keep a little bit of the smell away. Um, so it varies. But the the if there was a, a generalisation uh, to be had, then it would be that they are isolated, they're ashamed, they're depressed and suicidal. And do you think that was part of the pull towards this work for you is to restore that dignity and hope within these women? Yes, absolutely. I mean, to, to have a woman restored after being through that, um, it's, del it's absolutely delightful to see them, you know, smile again and, and laugh and interact and sit with people. I mean, I've had ladies come who are blind of cataracts and uh, I've said, you know, why don't we um, fix your cataract? And he said, oh, I don't care about that because, you know, if, if I'm blind, people will still sit with me and talk with me, but when I'm leaking urine, no one will even sit with me. So um, the shame that comes with that is, is profound. But going back, I just want to tell you one story about, I mean, some women are, are still loved and cared for. I've had 
you know, what I remember one man particularly, he cared for his wife for 20 years uh, with a fistula. And then he heard through our outreach workers, this was in northern Ethiopia, um, uh, that he, she could be cured. And he walked with her leaking urine on his back. They didn't have pads or anything like that. Did She was too poor to even have underpants or shoes. So he walked carrying her on his back for three days um, to, to come to the hospital. He sat beside a bed for those two weeks while she was getting better. And then... Um, yeah, carried her home. <laughs> so I mean, you meet some remarkable, lovely, lovely men as well. It's beautiful. And what is it through? Because these are very intense experiences. They're certainly not experiences that we see in our daily lives here in Australia. Um, what is it that you've really admired in in the humanity of people going through these really challenging experiences? For these women, it's their resilience, it's their their strength, um, what they've been through, and the hope that they have. Um, yeah, that's that's yeah, they're encouraging, and that's a shared humanity. Wherever we are, uh, we can share in that resilience, we can share in that hope, we can and share in that. Um, well, it, it basically comes down to a, a Christian principle, and I've modelled myself on Christ after I devoted my life to him at the age of 14. And that's um, his greatest command is, first of all, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then to love your neighbour as yourself. And love, um, yeah, when you love these people, you can connect with them, even if you can't speak their their language. And that's a very powerful thing. If I could tell you another story of a lady very early on in my career, um, she had such awful injuries, I just couldn't cure her. So, you know, the whole bladder was destroyed. Most of her uh, lower bowel was destroyed. I did what we could. We could get her continent of feces, but bladder couldn't get better. Um, and, you know, she was hoping for a cure, um, but we couldn't cure her. And so I was very upset, wanting to be able to help her, of course, because it's very hard for a doctor to say, look, there's nothing more we can do for you. We could do a diversion operation, but for her, it wasn't suitable for some other medical reasons. Um, and so I sat with her and said, look, we've tried everything. We, we can't get you better. And um, I was very sorry for that. But she just looked at me, so oh, don't worry. That's that's fine because my people, when I was with, when I had this injury, they wouldn't even sit with me, but you've held me. You've helped me stand up. You've put your arms around me when I was leaking urine and feces. You've shown me love when that's enough. So um, anyone can do that. Anyone can share love with anybody, um, particularly those who are vulnerable and, and in need. And um, that to share, I mean, you can do it across different languages, different cultures, different um, genders, different age groups. I mean, it's just a, a common thing that's the, the foundation of our Christian life is to, to love your neighbour as yourself. So do you feel like in the, the healing process for, for people that are experiencing challenges with their health, that one of the best things that we can do is to come together and just show compassion and love with each other? Uh, yeah, yes, I definitely believe so. And that's what the African cultures do so well, and that's what we probably lack in our, our Western culture, what's gone away. I mean, the Western culture is so individual. Um, it's um, Everyone's... Well, especially now in lockdown, everyone's we're in lockdown in Sydney where I am, or north of Sydney. Um, everyone's alone in their houses or on their screens or, or something like that. And that's one of the biggest shocks that happened, uh, struck our family when we moved back to Africa, how alone everyone is in Australia. If they're out on the street, they're walking alone or they're running alone or they're riding their bike alone or doing something alone. Well, you never, ever see that in Africa. There's a whole community. You're, you're always doing something with somebody. There's a lot more laughter. There's a lot more fun in the African um, the cultures that we've been living in, our family's been living in for the last 17 years. Um, and, and that's... Interesting too, because in suffering, and um, there's a whole culture around suffering. So if someone's sick, you come and sit with them, you be with them, you feed them, um, you visit them. You, 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 there's a whole you know culture behind supporting each other. Uh, and even at a funeral, you know what to do. Everyone goes and sits with the grieving family for you know a period of a week after the, the death. So you go and sit in the house. Um, you don't have to speak or anything. You're just there supporting and grieving. And if they cry, you cry with them. Um, but I mean, here in Australia, if someone dies, you're really unsure what you should do. Should you go visit? Should you just you know drop a bowl of soup at the front door? Or you know what what do you do? Um, but there's something very comforting in having that culture and that expectation that everyone knows what they do and everyone feels they're supported and bonded through those times of suffering. 
Yeah, definitely. I um, have been to Kenya quite a few times and it always amazed me every time that I went there, I just felt this overwhelming sense of peace and almost like I felt home. And I've always reflected on what that was. And I think part of it was just a lot of the noise is missing in Africa that we have here in Australia. And I think, as you said, people come together and they're very present with each other and um, they're all about the sense of community. And um, yeah, I certainly in my experience have, have always felt lighter in, in, in those communities um, than being in Australia. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that as well. And it's something we could learn def- as, as a culture in Australia, the Western culture could definitely learn um, from Africa. So in knowing that, because obviously you've lived in different parts of Africa for 17 years, which is a very long time, what would be some things that you personally think have helped in your life in, in, in terms of, I suppose, a sense of, happiness and contentment that people could bring into their own lives here in Australia? Um, yeah, that comes really for me and for many people is the, the grounding of faith. Uh, so, um, I mean, it says in the Bible so regularly in the, that the things of this world that, that the Australian culture, the Western culture seem to strive for, like a house, a career, all all those sort of things, they're, they're going to pass one day. They're going to crumble away. They're going to come to nothing. Um, in you know, fifty years' time, I'll be dead, and um, my kids will remember me. But another fifty years, they'll be dead, and their grandkids, their kids probably won't even know me or know of me. Um, all these things, all our achievements, all. Will pass, but um, if you look to something eternal, which I believe that is in in Christ, is in, in God, it gives you much um, a much more solid grounding and a, a fearless grounding to be able to go into some very difficult places sometimes, like Congo, Somalia, Sierra Leone, um, South Sudan. Uh, yeah, but to go into those places with confidence, knowing that you know these things are, are going to pass, um, but my my life with Christ, my life with God, is eternal. And it gives you a great deal of strength. And uh, having that faith too, um, despite all those difficulties, I've been at times in my life, I've been very sick, I've had my life threatened. Um, it gives you just a reassurance that you know, there is something beyond this world that's, that's to strive for is, is much more meaningful. Um, and it's a, a common language as well uh, to be able to do this work. So even though you're working in different languages, different cultures, very vastly different cultures. But if you have a, a common um, uh, grounding, uh, you can actually communicate with each other and, and do great things. And so the, the values, whether you're a Muslim or a Christian or whatever, the values in the Bible that you all will commonly share, um, you can communi- communicate with. So even if we've got you know hospitals in Muslim areas, you know, we can we can go back to um the, the, the grounding text of, of our shared um, literature uh, and say this is the way we should be doing, this is the way you should be treating the patients. Whereas if you don't have that and you don't have the same culture like with the big NGOs, um, their, their common language is money and um, often that money breeds corruption and, and greed and all those sort of things which brings a different, um, a different um, set of problems. And so if you say, oh, you must be doing this, otherwise we'll dock your pay or we'll do this, we'll reward you more. But if you have a, a faith system um, and a common belief system, then you can work towards that uh, with a, a common purpose, which has been how we've achieved what we've done. I mean, we're not only treating fistulas, we're also preventing fistulas. So in 2009, I started at a new charity called the Barbara May Foundation. And um, we want to prevent fistulas by building maternity hospitals and offering free deliveries for poor women so they don't get this in the first place. That's the only way you're going to prevent fistula. Uh, and so with that, that common faith of people, we've been able to do that. And we've so far, we've delivered about 80,000 women um, for free uh, across our networks. And um, yeah, we're hopefully expanding as we get more opportunities to, as we get more funds, we'll certainly be increasing that work. That's an incredible amount of people. Um yeah, I, I certainly admire you for that work. Just going back to um, what you were saying sort of about being a, a faith-based organisation, that was something that I found really fascinating in your book and it was quite indirect but 
you did sort of speak about those larger organizations such as the United Nations and things like that. And obviously throughout your experience of being over in Africa for so long, you've come um, into close proximity with different types of organizations. Um, What is it that you think is the most important and fundamental difference between supporting, say, an organization like yours and something that's much bigger or, or, or different to sort of that faith-based organization? Yeah, I think the, um, and there's many things I could say there, probably some <laughs> of might be a bit too controversial <laughs> in the trouble. Um, <laughs> like I said, I did see it was indirect in the book. <laughs> yeah, I was I filling in the blanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I have been involved in many places across Africa and seen the big organisations in action. And uh, I'm, they do some. They do good work, of course, and uh, we're very thankful for that. But a lot of funds get swallowed up in their bureaucracy. And um, you know, for example, at the moment in the Afa area of Ethiopia, where my aunt is working, there's famine, there's people dying of thirst, um, and she's actually the only one responding to that need uh, right now. Because uh, the larger organisations, they're they're so bound up in their bureaucratic systems that takes them ages to respond, and you know they're chewing up tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars while they go through their systems. And meanwhile, people are dying of thirst. But if you have a, a small, nimble, faith-based organisation, the church gives the money done, the, all the water ship there, people saved. So it's um, it makes you a lot more nimble, not having those large um, bureaucratic, often obstructive systems um, in the way. And um, so you can be a lot more effective, a lot, lot less funds and a lot more effective. I mean, that's my experience. I'm, I'm sure if you spoke to someone who worked for those bigger organisations, they'd say yeah, uh, very different. But um, that's been repeatedly my experience from actually about 25 years working on the ground in Africa. Yeah, I think that's one of the more difficult things for people that want to contribute to organizations. And they're very well intentioned with putting their mind, uh, their money behind certain organizations. But it's hard for us to sort of be able to understand how much of that money is going through to what they say it's going through to. Yeah, I mean, there's a benchmark figure that we have in our organization. So between 11 to 13% goes on administrative costs. And um, so that's, you know, staff salary and um, uh, and also fundraising costs. I mean, it, you, you have to spend money to, to make money. And so that's um, that's the, go- the gold standard in, a, in Australia. That people like to try and aim to uh, less than 15%. So we're below the 15%, but there's a lot of charities out there that's 30%, even more, um, just go on their their running costs. So most of the money that we receive goes to um, uh, directly to the women in Africa, uh, which we're proud of. And actually, of those overhead costs, we've got a a very generous um, donor who donates about 50% of them. So, I mean, in... So in real terms, if you donated to Barbara May Foundation, that would mean only about, um, let's say about 7%, say, uh, will go on administrative costs, the rest go directly to the, the women in Africa. And as you've shared with um, your maternity centre, you've you've touched the lives of about 80,000 women so far. What is the larger goal for you in all of this? Yeah, so they they estimate that, uh, well, first of all, we've built three maternity hospitals and run them, two in Ethiopia, one in Tanzania. My aunt has a, a network of around close to a 1,000 birth attendants in the villages of Afar, the nomadic villages that we've trained and I've helped train them to. And we, together, we do, they deliver about between eight to 10,000 ladies a year. Uh, and we've just, with a partnership with the Lutheran Church, opened a new maternity centre two weeks ago in um, Juba in South Sudan. So that's exciting as well. So we've now got um, four uh, maternity centres. We'd love to expand. It's been estimated that um, across, or if we're going to prevent women dying from having babies and getting fistulas across Africa, then we need to build 2,000 maternity centres. So um, here we've only got 1,996 to go. So that's the the ongoing plan. (laughs) (laughs) That's absolutely incredible. so obviously with your um, auntie, she has seemed to be a very big influence on your life. What are some lessons that you've learned from her in her experience and to my understanding, very deep commitment to helping um, many people in Ethiopia? 
Yeah, so my aunt's uh, an unusual lady. She's probably the, the black sheep of the family. <laughs> and she's absolutely extraordinary. What she's done, what she's sacrificed, what she's achieved. I mean, I know many, my old boss, Catherine Hammond, is a lovely, gracious lady. Her and her husband started the Fistula Hospital in Ethiopia. But I know many, many people like Catherine um, all across Africa doing marvellous marvelous work, that, uh, devoted 50 years of their life plus to, to people in impoverished areas. And um, almost all of them, motivated from their faith but um i have them on that level but val is kind of like a <laughs> just a different <laughs> class altogether i mean she's she's married into the afar tribe she lives like a, a nomad her, her entire worldly possessions are a couple of dresses and a pair of flip-flops in her computer that she works with i mean she sleeps outside um every night because it's so hot she lives on a compound in the desert and um you with about 50 other impoverished people that you know need help in one way or other blind people or hov patients or you know babies that have been discarded and found in toilets and you know all sorts of horrible horrible things um and so she's loving them and caring for them but she runs this huge organization um directly looking after one and a half million FR people. And she has 32 different projects of which health is one of them and of which um, maternal health is part. So you can just give you an idea of the scope of what she covers. And she just works relentlessly, tirelessly. She pays herself about $100 a month. Um, and that's what she she lives off and gives everything else um, away to, to the poor. She's sacrificed everything. And she's been in danger many times. I mean, she's been chased by gunships across the desert um, you know, those are helicopters shooting at her. And, um, you know, she's <laughs> been part of fighting. She's been per, um, uh, yeah, in danger of fighting now, actually. And um, you know, she's had malaria who, who, how many times and you know, trying to resuscitate people dying of tuberculosis, exposing herself to tuberculosis. And, you know, in very, very difficult areas, We're talking about in the desert under, under trees and, you know, not with you know, nice sterile medical conditions as we have. Um, to be in persona non grata of Ethiopia, I mean, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Djibouti in her life because, you know, she's standing up with people's rights and the people in power don't like that. She's a very, very feisty woman and uh, achieved a lot. And uh, she's done it strengthened by her faith. I mean, she, um, when you're in the desert with her, at the, as the sun's coming up, she's huddled, she's a tiny thing. She's very skinny. She's about a little over five foot. And um, just huddled over, um, just reading her Bible and praying. Um, and that's how she'll start, you know, every single day. And that's you know, the word of God strengthens her to, to get through each day. And she just works and works and just gives and gives and gives. So an inspiring, incredible, incredible woman. Um, very feisty at times. So you have to be careful what you say at times. So unless she's mellowed, <laughs> mellowed a fair bit with her age. <laughs> um, yeah, but she's she's 70 now. And uh so 71, and you know, still living that life in the desert, no comforts, but giving herself to the people that um, she loves. It sounds like you and her are driven by very similar things. Obviously, you've both been in very dangerous and challenging situations throughout your work. What is it that comes to your mind, like in any moments of potentially sort of, I'm not sure if you even have them, but like questioning why you're here or whether you should be putting your life in danger. Like, is there a certain like mantra or anything that sort of comes to your mind that just kind of pulls you through in those moments? Um, yeah, I like to say that there's no atheists in in on in the trenches or in the the front line that sort of thing. If you got a gun pointed to your head, you you, you pray, and um, and so in those times, and yes, there's been many times that I've um, wondered what on earth am I doing here? Why am I back in Australia having a nice simple life? Well, I'm back in Australia today, but hopefully getting back to <laughs> to Africa before too long. Um, yeah, so, but it always comes back to my faith again and and prayer. So my day too, like my up hour, I bring, begin every day reading the Bible. And I have, um, and it's amazing when you do read the Bible, how true it speaks to, into every situation. Uh, there's a lot of the Bible that's hard to interpret, but um, um, but you know, after you study the Bible, it becomes um, very real, and it just feels it seems like God's speaking directly to your heart when you read some of the passages, and it's so encouraging. It, it grounds you in what's right and what's eternal, um, uh, and gives you a different perspective per perspective in life, and that's what keeps you going. So those moments of doubt, you just get strength from praying and and reading God's word. 
And do you feel a level of responsibility that comes to this work? Well, that's the, the beauty about the Christian faith as well. Um, we have only done what we've done by our faith and, um, and it's been quite some miraculous answers to prayer, not only in sometimes healing of patients, some absolutely amazing healings of patients. If I could just tell you one of them, I could tell you so many, thousands of them. But one lady got um, a fistula from a hippopotamus. Uh, she was gathering... Um, uh, grass on the side of a lake um, to, to take her to feed her goats or whatever. And a uh, hippopotamus came out of the lake and, and knocked her over and four tons of hippopotamus trod on her pelvis. So it shattered her pelvis. Uh, she crawled um, back to her, her hut and um, and she lay in their hut, some people were looking after her, of course, lay in, in the hut for um, was it three months before one of our outreach workers found her and brought her to us. And um, because the the blown bones of her broken pelvis had severed her, the nerve to her left leg and also severed her bladder. And so she was had a fistula from the, the bones severing her bladder and she was leaking urine. That's how she came to us. And when she came, she had pressure sores right down to her bones on her, on her back, um, very impoverished, completely depressed, wouldn't even look anyone in the eye, just wanted to give up and die. Uh, and but we prayed with her and uh, we showed her love. Uh, we got her eating again, and, and gradually, gradually, gradually. I mean, we um, tried to operate very difficult with fractures to a pelvis, and actually, with that injury in Australia, you have a 90% chance of dying because um, it's a you know, comp what's called a compound fracture of the pelvis, very dramatic injury. Um, anyway, six months later, she walked out of the, the hospital completely dry and absolutely overjoyed. She'd been touched by Christ's love. Her, and I like to think that Christ touched her heart as well because her persona completely changed as we talked about Christ loving her and wanting to, to help her um, from being someone who was almost overnight for someone who was wanting, not wanting to even look anyone in the eye uh, or even speak or lift a head uh, to someone who was just delighted to see each every day, smiling, laughing and, and full of hope and joy. And only, you know, only a heavenly God can really touch people's hearts. I mean, as doctors, we can do so much for people's bodies and we think they're really clever, but we, we can never touch people's hearts and only something above us um, can do that. And that's um, the basis of the Christian faith. And it touched her heart physically and, and spiritually because, I mean, she had a severed nerve to her leg and she walked away out of the hospital six months later. And just absolute miracle. And I could tell you so many stories, stories like that. And um, I think um, the old saying goes that uh, God heals, but doctors get paid for it. Is um, <laughs> very true. <laughs> so with the uh, adjustment period for women, do they have support through that? Because a lot of the stories that you shared in your book, um, you know, many of these women have been isolated for years and you know, a lot of them not even moving and, and, you know, struggling to sort of get up on their feet because they've been in a fetal position or something like that, to then be healed and able to live a somewhat more normal life again, do they have people that support them mentally throughout that experience? Because it's almost like a really big transformation of, of I, their, their own personality, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah, and that's um, the, the strength of the African people that I've been working with as well. They're so resilient. I mean, if they do get better, they're accepted back in the community, they're, they're happy and they're, they can go back into their, their normal roles. But if they're still leaking, um, they're um, uh, still depressed, they're still suicidal, they're still ashamed, um, even though they you know, might have a lovely husband with them, like that man I told you about carrying her on her back. Um, yeah, so that, but generally, and uh, if they're cured, they, they, they dramatically bounce back. Um, and we actually did some studies into mental health early on back in the 2000s. And that's where we found with you know, basic mental health screening tests um, that pretty well everyone was depressed and 40% committing suicide or trying to thinking about or, or, or attempting suicide. Um, but if they were cured, we did the, the same test um, after they were cured, the same screening test. And if they were cured, you know, back down to the screening positive as the background normal population was. So, um, yeah, they bounce back 
uh, very, very resiliently. And some of them have been through awful injuries. I, um, I remember one lady I met in DRC in, in Congo during the war, and um, she was raped, gang raped by 10 soldiers, or she thinks 10, but many soldiers, and then a gun put in her vagina and shot. So um, just, uh, just a wickedness, malicious, horrible evil from the, those men. And so she was left, um, left for dead. And but she survived, and she had a obviously a, a big fistula. Um, but she was found by mission, brought to the hospital. We we cared for her, and she was you no, know, she was happy. And I said, "Well, how are you happy after being through such suffering as you've been through?" And she said, oh, "I'm happy because God's looking after me. Because every step of the way, that I, when I needed help, God's provided people to help me. Even though she'd been through that, many people would blame God for." I mean, being in that situation, but she had the different view that God's been helping her to get out of that situation. And that sort of different perspective and, and worldviews given these women a great deal of strength. And I know in your story you speak about forgiveness. And when you tell this story about, you know, people gang raping a, a woman and then putting a gun in her vagina and shooting it, how do you look at situations like that and people like that? What is it? Do you, do you see, do you think we should show up in compassion and forgiveness or what has been your experience through the last 17 years of seeing things like this firsthand? How do you process that? For those people who have actually done those things? You yeah. Know? Yeah. They're, I mean, of course it angers you. It fills you with with rage and um yeah there's that's the beauty about um the gospel as well that there's justice um you know god is a, a god of justice um he, yes he'll forgive you um if you come and repent and turn around and and turn from your evil ways as it says in the bible but if you're not then there's going to be god's justice coming upon you and that's a, a fearful horrible horrible thing um and so one day there will be justice and um yeah, and those men, if they're caught now, they should be brought to account and, and given justice. Um, yeah, so there's, there's not just brushing things away and and under the carpet, but I mean, if they do do even in this world, I mean, that now if they do, you know, turn around and say sorry, that's great, but they've still got to you know do their time and and punishment for what they've done. There's consequences for the the evil that you do. And in witnessing these sorts of things at particularly human suffering at quite a deep level does that show up in any way in your life now having committed to so long and so much of your life to being at the forefront of helping human suffering do you ever experience moments particularly back in Australia where there's a lot less of that that I certainly see does that does that show up in any way in your everyday life now that you're back in Australia? I mean, the Australian, the human condition is very strange, isn't it? I mean, we can live in such physical comfort as we do in Australia. Um, you know, when we came back to Australia, there really isn't much to, to worry about from a physical sense. We've got water in the house, um, you know, several months, six months in it. When we moved to northern Ethiopia, we didn't have water in the house. So every day you're, you're trying to work out how you're going to get water um buckets and carrying and also catching rainwater and things like that it's stressful but you know when you get water in the house you're just so euphoric you think that's nothing's going to worry you ever again um so when I mean, you don't have those sort of physical problems here in australia if you're sick you've got um you've got doctors you've got hospitals they're all free um whereas in northern ethiopia again i had to do a small procedure on my son because i was the only doctor around at the time and had to give him an anesthetic and you know that's very stressful no no backup um and then uh i mean if there's you know a problem with security you got police will come and do the work and just physically there's 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 not much to worry about in australia but mentally in australia anxiety depression um broken families uh, much higher than i experienced back in back in Africa. And so there's <clears throat> suffering for sure, but on a, a different level and a different type of suffering. So the suffering here isn't so much physical, it's uh, interrelational and it's um, interpersonal. And um, which again, I think is a problem with our culture that we're so individualistic 
and not part of a, a supportive community and, and loving each other um, is, you know, first of all, the, the Christian principle of loving your neighbour as yourself, uh, and then, you know, hopefully a community principle about supporting each other and being with each other. And what does life look like for you now that you're based in Australia, but you continue to go back overseas? Yeah, so, yeah, based in Australia for the last three years, um, uh, hopefully when the boys leave home, we might move back, but um, we'll, we'll see, uh, see what the future holds. But um, at the current time, before COVID came, I was travelling back about five or six times a year to teach and operate in various places and check on our hospitals and so forth. Um, but now, coronavirus time, I only went overseas three times last year, and um, it was going to be three times this year, uh, but for longer, <clears throat> because we've got to factor in new quarantine times and all that sort of thing. And um, yeah, but uh, I just had to cancel. I was meant to be in Tanzania now, actually, but uh, I had to cancel this trip because my wife, poor wife, broke her foot. So it's only going to be twice, <laughs> twice this year, as long as the government give me permission. Of course, um, I've got to still obtain permission for going back in October. So I'm praying that that will come through. So I need to visit Ethiopia, Tanzania, Uganda, and South Sudan in October and November, and uh, operate in those places. God willing, we'll see. You continue to operate, um, and also do you do training when you're over there as well? Yeah, so another job that I have is with the um, what's called FIGO. FIGO is the International Federation of Obstetricians Gynecologists. So it's the umbrella organisation, global organisation for obstetricians gynecologists. So there's a million and a half obstetricians gynecologists as members. And um, so they have our 12 committees, and I'm the chair of one committee, which is fistula. And so we look at and um, trauma. So we look after... Um, the global fistula training program <laughs> so even this morning i was you know finalizing the new training manual and so forth and we've got trainees across uh, 22 different countries and so my job is to to train the trainers in, in fistula surgery so um i've always i can't remember the last time i operated without a, a trainee and uh so in our hospitals are all, all, all of course local staff and they're all very well trained and doing a marvellous job, not only preventing fistulas, delivering babies safely, working in the communities, teaching people about, you know, fistula prevention and, you know, what to do for a pregnant lady and so forth, um, but also training the surgeons. So uh, we've got um, good fistula surgeons now all, all around Africa um, and doing marvellous, marvellous work. And I'm still in touch with a lot of them, you know, all the way from Sierra Leone to Madagascar to Nepal um, and everywhere between. Yeah, so the work has certainly spread since the early days when it was only a handful of people when I started at the Catherine Hamlin's Hospital. But with the Barbara May Foundation, Catherine Hamlin's Hospital is still doing it just in Ethiopia. <clears throat> so we've kind of helped to spread it um, all across the world. And in terms of fundraising, uh, is that your own initiative back in Australia to continue fundraising to uh, get more of the 1,996 hospitals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So fundraising is really tough. Uh, it takes a lot of energy and I wish I didn't have to do it, but we have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise you can't. But a, a little bit of money goes a long way. It only costs 200 Australian dollars for um, a woman to have her four clinic visits while she's pregnant in a hospital. So all ultrasounds, blood tests and things. And then her delivery in our hospital, which might include a, a cesarean, which is the operation to have your baby. It's um, 14% chance for cesarean um uh your postnatal check so uh checking you and the baby afterwards and immunize a child uh, 200 australian dollars so it doesn't cost a, a lot of money uh we can build a, a simple hospital for about half a million dollars I mean, we built a big one in um in tanzania that cost about uh, two million dollars but that's a yeah, great big one. And um, but a, a simple hospital that has a capacity for about two and a half thousand deliveries a year that we can build for about half a million dollars. But it's very, very difficult to raise money to build hospitals to prevent fistulas, maternal health. To build a fistula hospital, I could literally have the money within a week. Uh, there's a lot of money in the world for fistula treatment, but fistula prevention is um, yeah, a heck of a lot harder. I'd just love to say I highly admire you and all the work that you've done and certainly continue to fundraise for. On a final note, I would love to ask you, what does it mean to you to be human? Um, well, first of all, thanks, Jenna, for that comment. But it's only because <laughs> God's enabled me to be able to do that. So I wouldn't say it's, I don't take credit for that. But so that really answers the, the next question, what it is to be human. I think um, what it if you have a faith, I mean, if you believe that God is real and he's your creator, to really be human is to know your creator. 
and that's certainly given me a great deal of joy even in those difficult times in Somalia or in Congo or those other places that I've been to that have been tremendously difficult uh, it certainly still gives you a peace of mind and a strength and a joy even in those circumstances that uh, to know your creator and there's something beyond this world so to me to know your creator is what it really is to be human <laughs>